Good morning, everyone, and thank you very much for this opportunity. There's a, there's a current assumption in the scholarship and practice of international criminal law and transitional justice that if a little is good, a lot must be better. Scholars and practitioners alike now argue for holistic responses to serious human rights violations. And one of the major justice legacies that we see is that through the ICTR, the national courts, and Gachacha, Rwanda provides an early and important example of international justice operating in concert with domestic accountability processes, offering a valuable opportunity to examine holism in practice. So what I want to do today is offer a review of the for some of the formal and informal interactions that have occurred between these different sites of justice exploring Lawrence Rosen's suggestion that it may be in law that the contest between the sense of the local and the global will receive some of its most serious testing. In his examination of law as culture, Rosen posits that the relationship should be understood as reciprocal, despite the seemingly incommens incommensurate array of powers between the, the local and the global. And so I'm going to structure my exploration of this reciprocity around three main points. So first I want to suggest that an interpretive methodology can deepen the current legal and political scholarship on Rwanda's post-genocide courts. Understanding the legal cultures of the ICTR, the national courts, and Gachacha allows us to better explain how the courts have interacted with one another. Second, I then want to discuss specific points of interaction, first between the ICTR and the Gachacha community courts, discussing how the ICTR has made use of the Gachacha records in their trial decisions. Then I want to briefly touch on the Gachacha courts themselves. And finally, I want to look at the national courts in the ICTR looking at the transfer of cases under Rule 11 bis, in which drawing on detailed ethnographic work, I want to show that an understanding of legal cultures of the courts illuminates very important points of contestation between the jurisdictions. And then I want to conclude with a brief comment on the way in which international criminal justice may learn from the recent direction of the ICTR and move towards fostering a culture of complementarity. So despite the clear jurisdictional delineation between the ICTR, the National Courts and Gachacha, in practice, the courts have overlapped in a number of important ways. First, the, po the first point of interaction has been informal. All the courts have relied very heavily on oral testimony and accomplice evidence, and as a result, most witnesses have participated in one or more of Rwanda's post-genocide courts. Second, the courts have interacted formally with one another, through e as evidence raised in one court has been introduced in the proceedings of another, and suspects have been transferred among the jurisdictions. And this transfer has happened from the national courts to Gachacha, from Gachacha back to the national <coughs> courts, from the ICTR to, uh, to the national courts, and, all the, and in the early practice of the ICTR, of the national courts to the ICTR. So we see this real complex interaction that has occurred throughout the lifespan of these, justi these, inter these justice processes. Yet despite these clear and unavoidable overlaps, there's strikingly limited scholarship on the three post-genocide courts together. To date, the writings on all three courts have focused either on examining them in terms of retributive or restorative notions of justice, or on arguing that they offer some sort of blueprint for plural responses to atrocity. But there's been very little attention to how the courts have actually interacted with each other in practice. So drawing on Clifford Garrett's description, a di choice to engage in an elaborate venture in thick description, the objective of my research has been to interpret how post-genocide courts' actions were produced, perceived, and interpreted by those applying the law and those subject to it to explore both elite and common understandings of criminal justice in Rwanda. And in order to do this, between 2008 and 2013, I've conducted 186 interviews with ICTR, 
in national Rwandan court and Gachacha um, judges and lawyers, government officials, and a group of Rwandan citizens who have been subject to the authority of all three of these courts. Through the coding of this data, I was able to draw out some of the dominant ways through which the legal practitioners have ascribed meaning to their work, making visible the legal cultures of the institutions. And let's now turn to see how that allows us to better understand how the courts have actually interacted with each other. So among the international judges and lawyers interviewed at the ICTR, the court was principally understood to have contributed to developing international case law. As one senior judge stated, the contribution of the court, the contribution of the case law goes without saying. The Akayesu, Kambanda and media judgments being three of the seminal ones. A huge body of legal knowledge has now been established. These words reflected the sentiment expressed by the majority of participants across prosecution chambers and defense. Among these legal professionals, there was a clear emphasis on the development of international case law as the primary contribution of the tribunal. Respondents tended to identify two key components to their understanding of the court's actions. First, the contribution of the tribunal to defining the elements of the crimes within the statute, particularly regarding the crime of gen genocide. And second, participants emphasized the creation of a body of case law that's provided, as one prosecutor said, the building blocks for the ICC. The work of the courts was described by another respondent as creating a global movement and by another as fostering a tradition of international justice. But how the ICTR participants described and understood their own work was consistent with how they then made sense of the work of the national courts and of the Chacha. In line with an interpretive analysis, how the courts understand their own work elucidates aspects of the institution's legal culture and it's in the specific legal culture that the work of the other courts is assessed. Consistent with the emphasis on the creation of international case law, participants inside the ICTR generally saw the activities of the court as a means of establishing this international system of justice. With regard to the Rwandan national courts, this, the judges, uh, one judge argued, you must remember that the tribunal is not just about Rwanda, it's about the world. The, the Rwandan judiciary did not in any way stand up to the standards of international justice. The perspectives on Kachacha painted a similarly interesting and important picture of how these separate courts have operated. Most participants initially emphasized the distinct nature of Kachacha and the ICTR, suggesting that they had operated very separately. This was supported by numerous participants' responses that they didn't know very much about Kachacha. There was a careful and consistent distancing of the ICTR's work from Gachacha in order not to be too critical. As one senior participant in chamber stated, the ICTR has adopted a hands-off approach to Gachacha. It's not our job to criticize it. Yet, despite this interest in distancing their work from that of the Gachacha courts, the ICTR's decisions have referred extensively to the local courts. Out of the 74 cases tried by the ICTR that have been decided at the trial chamber level, 52 have made reference to evidence gathered by the Gachacha courts. More strikingly, since the nationwide implementation of Gachacha in 2005, the ICTR has judged 49 individuals for their alleged involvement in the genocide, and 47 out of these 49 cases have used and made reference to the Gachacha courts. An analysis of these judgments shows that the ICTR's use of these documents has unfortunately often been misdirected, but where the Chamber has been able to have a more grounded and informed view of the local courts, they have been able to better make use of the evidence gathered in Gachacha. The most common use of the Gachacha judgments when you look through the trial chamber decisions is that defense counsel have argued that their clients have not been mentioned in Rwandan domestic proceedings dealing with the crimes charged in their indictment. Although the trial chambers have generally been skeptical of this defense, none of these cases have admitted a full set of Gachacha proceedings and neither has the chamber requested these documents. Only one ICTR case makes arguably the most effective use of the Gachacha records and it's also the first and the last to have evidence produced by an expert witness 
on the functioning of the local courts. In the Sotaco decision, in finding that the prosecutor had not established beyond a reasonable doubt that Rachel Makuntumu was killed by Sotaco on the 8th of April, 1994, the chamber referred to a number of Gachacha documents which recorded the death of that particular victim as being as occurring in a different commune in what was then the prefecture of the Seni. As has been clearly shown in the empirical work on Gachacha, the determination of individual deaths, the naming of victims, and the location of their bodies constitutes one of the principal focuses of the Gachacha courts and an area where effective collaboration between the courts would have been invaluable and could have been extended. How the ICTR judges and lawyers have interpreted their own actions helps, helps explain the international court's general skepticism towards the localised court's processes, raising tensions, I would suggest, in the court's ability to complement one another. However, and this is important, the ICTR is not alone in this. A very, very similar trend was seen inside the other two Rwandan post-conflict institutions. Inside the, the national courts, you saw the make it that the judges and lawyers were making sense of the work of the tribunal and the localized courts in terms of their own idea about what the national courts had contributed to the transitional period. And I won't have time to talk about this in detail, but you saw this, inc this very strong focus by the Rwandan prosecutors, um, independent lawyers and judges on the development of judicial capacity. And it was on these terms that they then engaged with the ICTR in the initial referral decisions. Inside Gachacha, and I'll touch on this in the last five minutes, inside Gachacha we saw the pursuit of information about the conflict emerged as the dominant justification by the local judges called the Inyanga Mugail as to what their work had achieved. As one in Younger Mughal, a Hutu woman with no formal schooling but a very intimate understanding of the conflict articulated, to me, Gachacha was crucial. I was one of the people who saved people, helped them with their lives. That's why I was elected. It's not as easy as people think. There were people who were killed for helping others. There were those who actively killed, and there were those who did not kill. It's helped a lot with the unity of these people. Now, interestingly, what is, what is interesting about her position on one part is that she's articulating the need for these localized accountability processes as a form of establishing intra-Hutu unity and accountability. Consistent with Gachacha's interpretation of what it saw as its main objective of this localized account of the conflict, the ICTR and the national courts were measured against what was understood as the principal contribution of the local courts. The criticism most routinely identified by the Inyanga Mugail of the ICTR was not that it had taken too long or cost too much, but rather that there was a need to ensure accountability of the most senior accused to the affected community in terms of that community making an, their, their process of making sense of how the conflict had played out in that particular place. As one Inyanga Mugail said, in Arusha the big fish are there. Those in Arusha haven't asked for forgiveness those in Arusha have committed many crimes here. They should face us, the Rwandan family, but they avoid us by being there. The impact of the ICTR's interpretations of its own priorities, over and above that of the ICTR and the national courts, has, has come to the fore in the recent extradition cases concerning the attempted extradition of four genocide suspects from the United Kingdom to Rwanda. During the course of the UK High Court cases, which ruled against extradition, it was brought to the attention of the court that two of the suspects had been tried and acquitted in absentia by Gachacha in the southern province. At the local level, the Gachacha courts had prioritized their own objectives. The pursuit of the cases by the Gachacha judges, despite the national court's clear intention to exercise their jurisdictional primacy, is in line with one of the central objectives of the Gachacha to better understand the conflict through providing full information about the events in the local area. The local courts were under pressure from the families of the accused to pursue the cases because of the possibility that the accused's immediate local community would provide exculpatory evidence. So we see, and similar types of divergence, as I suggest, also emerged when you went inside the national courts to understand what the national courts thought they had been achieving during the transitional period. 
And this resulted, I think, in the, during the initial transfer decisions in some deep misunderstandings between the ICTR and the national courts as to whether the national courts should be focusing on this development of domestic case law, of the domestication of international criminal case law, or whether they should be focusing on capacity building. And the national courts were seeing this change in, their, in, their, um, in this focus on, on domestic um, improvements in judicial and legal education as their primary contribution to the transitional period. But interestingly, what we've seen more recently is there's been a shift within the institutions and a meeting point where you have seen this move by the ICTR towards focusing and starting to understand how some of the national, how the national courts were interpreting their own position and their own ideas of what they were trying to achieve in the post-genocide moment. So what does this leave us in terms of, in terms of the practice of international criminal justice? I think that the two examples of how the Gachacha judgments, how the Gachacha documents were used by the ICTR in the Soromba judgment, and how the Rule 11 BIS decisions were approached um, more recently, in the, particularly in the Uinkindi case, show that more interaction and more detailed knowledge across institutions has led to better legal reasoning and more effective collaboration. The findings of the study, I think, have important implications for the operation of local, national, and international justice today. As noted, international and domestic accountability mechanisms are now routinely implemented in single country contexts. We've seen this with the ICC and with the recent, with the principle of complementarity. What we, ha we haven't seen just the operation of domestic prosecutions of international crimes. We've seen ICC prosecutions, for example, in um, Uganda, operating in, co in concert with domestic processes. If, as practice suggests, multiple justice processes are to become the policy norm, there must be direct, equal, and continued contact between judicial and legal officers in the institutions. It's potentially damaging to assume that local, national, and international will automatically complement one another. It is going to be necessary for us to actively foster a culture of complementarity that leads to unified and agreed points of, 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 and objectives around what these courts are aimed at achieving. Thank you very much.